Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. You will hear a science student inquiring about English courses at a university language centre. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 7. Hi, I've come to ask about the English courses you run for international students. Oh, right. I assume you're a student at the university. Yes, I've just started. Okay, well, we've got a range of courses. It depends what you think you need and how much. Oh. Um, we can't run everything at the same time, though. So, for example, in this first term, we are just doing a writing course. I see. That sounds quite useful. What else is there? Um, some of the courses only run for single terms, and we tend to focus on what students have difficulty with. That means we don't usually do speaking courses, but next term you can do listening. Oh. That'll help you with lectures and things. Our provision is all based on what the majority of our international students need. So, is everything term-based? There's nothing that you run all year? Well, let's have a look. Yes, there is a class for vocabulary and grammar every term. That's for everybody, but it's split into three or four levels. And what about in the holidays? We don't do anything during the winter or spring break. Mm. But over the summer, there's just general classes because that's what most students want. Mm. A bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, quite a variety then. Hmm. I'll uh, have a think about what I really need because I haven't got much time. Do you have about 20 students in each class, the same as our science seminars? We try to keep it at about 12 and certainly not more than 15. Mm -hmm. It's important for language classes. They're very different from your normal courses. Right. And how much are the classes? The rate varies depending on how many hours you attend, but you shouldn't have to pay. Usually, the department will fund you and even sort out which classes you need. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> it would be quite useful for me to have a certificate to take back to my country. Do you put us in for exams? Yes, but we don't like them to clash with your main course exams in June, so we run them in May. Oh. That leaves you time for revision. Do I have to sign up for something now? I'm not quite sure what I want. Classes haven't quite started yet, so you've got time to decide what you do. All we insist is that you sign up before week five. That gives you about three weeks to decide. OK. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 8 to 10. Then, when you've made up your mind, you need to come back here to the administration office to enroll. What do I need to bring with me when I enroll? My identity card, I guess? Yes, or your passport. Uh -huh. Then you'll be given a registration form, which you'll have to show to the teacher when you have your first class. OK. And um, should I ask my tutor about which classes I should do then? Yes. Then you get a note from him and give that to the desk when you register. Can I use the computers here as well? Yes. You'll be given a password when you go to your first class. So remember to bring a disk with you to save your work on, as you won't be allowed to save it on the hard drive. OK. Will I need anything else? Dictionary? We've got loads of those here that you can borrow. But you'll need a notebook as we don't provide paper or files. OK. Thanks.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a guide named Matt, who is introducing their trip in Wildlife Haven. Now you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen to the first part of the introduction carefully, and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Matt, and I'm one of the three guides here at Wildlife Haven. Our job is to make sure that you all have a great time here with us and go home feeling happy and relaxed. As you can see, we're away from the city in a remote area between a national park and the sea. To encourage you to relax. There are no radios or TVs, and the only phones and newspapers are in the office. So, if peace and quiet is what you've come for, this is the place to be. From your cabin on the hill, you'll find you have the national park behind you, and you can look out from the sea from your front balcony. Your luggage will be unloaded from the bus and taken to your rooms in a few minutes. Once you have picked up your key at reception, please locate your room and check that all your luggage has arrived. The daily program here at Wildlife Haven is flexible, and only as demanding as you want it to be. You should each have a brochure setting out the facilities and various walking tracks you can take. And on the bus, you are given a green sheet setting out a number of group tours in the coming week. If you want to join any tour, just write your name and room number on the relevant sheet along the wall here. Tomorrow there is a beachcombers and rockhoppers tour, exploring marine life in the rock pools along the beach. Or, if you'd prefer to go inland, there's a guided forest walk that takes you off the walking tracks. If you want to catch some lunch, you could join the beach fishing expedition. And at night, you'll see there is a moonlight forest walk that leaves each night at 7 p.m. So there is plenty to choose from at Wildlife Haven, and of course. That includes just sitting on your balcony watching the waves roll in, but I would recommend my favorite tour, the waterfall walk. This departs at sundown each day, and also provides the opportunity to have a moonlight swim. Now you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. In the second part of the introduction, you are going to get some advice from Matt. Listen carefully and answer questions sixteen to twenty. You've chosen to visit us in January, which is one of our hotter months. And although you may be tempted to wear a minimum of clothing, you should always take precautions against injury, particularly in the national park. This includes sensible footwear. You'd be surprised how many of our guests ignore this advice and end up being sorry. And socks are a good idea too. And even though you might be under trees a lot of the time, it's a good idea to wear a hat in this hot climate. There's no need to be too concerned about walking in the national park, provided you use common sense. It's true that there are poisonous spiders in the park, but they are really more frightened of you than you are likely to be of them. I should also warn you against eating any wild berries. Some are edible, but you should avoid them all. 
We'll provide all the food you can eat. Well, that's about all for now. Dinner is from 6 to 8 p.m. in this building. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. To hear a reporter from the New York Times who is presenting a news report prepared by Dion Cierci and Robert Gabaloff on the topic middle class shrinks. Further as more fall out instead of climbing up. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions. The middle class that President Obama identified in his State of the Union speech last week as the foundation of the American economy has been shrinking for almost half a century. In the late 1960s, more than half of the households in the United States were squarely in the middle earning. In today's dollars, $35,000 to $100,000 in year. Few people noticed or cared as the size of that group began to fall because the shift was primarily caused by more Americans climbing the economic ladder into upper income brackets. But since 2000, the middle class's share of households has continued to narrow, the main reason being that more people have fallen to the bottom. At the same time, fewer of those in this group fit the traditional image of a married couple with children at home, a gap increasingly filled by the elderly. This social upheaval helped explain why the president focused on reviving the middle class, offering a raft of proposals squarely aimed at concerns like paying for college education, taking parental leave, affording childcare and buying a home. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. Mr. Obama told Congress and the public, Still, regardless of their income, most Americans are identified as middle class. The term itself is so amorphous that politicians often cite the group in introducing proposals to engender white appeal. The definition here starts at $35,000, which is about 50% higher than the official poverty level for a family of four and ends at the six-figure mark. Although many Americans in households making more than $100,000 consider themselves middle class, particularly those living in expensive regions like the Northeast and Pacific Coast, they have substantially more money than most people. 
However, the lines are drawn. It is clear that millions are struggling to hang on to accoutrement that most experts consider essential to a middle class life. I would consider middle class to be people who can live comfortably on what they earn, can pay their bills, can set aside something to save for retirement and for kids in college, and can have vacations and entertainment, said Christine L. Owens, Executive Director of the National Employment Law Project. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. In this section, you'll hear a lecture on coral reef. First, you have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Do you fancy diving in the wonderful world of coral reefs, green sponges, colourful fish, and red crabs? It is a rich garden beneath the waves. But how much do you know about the corals? Are they animals or plants? What are the threats to coral reefs? Today, Mr. Tim Harford, Executive Director of the Coral Reef Alliance. Is going to introduce the facts about coral reefs. Good afternoon, everyone. Coral reefs are one of nature's most magnificent creations. It is filled with thousands of unique and valuable plants and animals. Over one quarter of all marine species depend on healthy coral reefs. Humans also depend on coral reefs. These marine ecosystems are the primary source of food and income for millions of people. A vast repository of valuable chemical compounds and medicines, and a natural wave barrier that protect beaches and coastlines from waves and storms. Coral is actually the exoskeletons of coral polyps, made from limestone. These skeletons build up over time, forming the reef. New corals are born each April. At a certain hour on a certain night. Mature corals suddenly release clouds of eggs and sperm into the sea. After the fertilized eggs take root on the sea floor, they can grow up to fifteen centimeters per year. Coral reefs are present in the waters of over one hundred countries. These are warm, eighteen to twenty-nine degrees centigrade, shallow, sunny regions, primarily between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Only clear, warm salt water can support a coral reef, and because sunlight is crucial to the reef's survival, the water must also be shallow. The algae that grow on coral provide much of the coral's food. In deeper water, algae cannot get the sunlight they need to grow. Most coral reefs are in the tropics because natural conditions there are perfect. In their modern form. Coral reefs have thrived on Earth for over fifty million years. In recent years, however, more than eleven percent of the world's reefs have been lost, with another sixteen percent severely damaged during the El Nino event in 1998. Up to thirty-two percent of coral reefs may be destroyed by human activities in the next thirty years if we do not take action now. Corals and coral reefs are extremely sensitive. Slight changes in the reef environment may have detrimental effects on the health of entire coral colonies. These changes may be due to a variety of factors. One of the greatest threats to coral reefs is human expansion or development. As human population increases, 
so does the harvest of resources from the sea. Due to overfishing, reef fish populations have been greatly decreased in some areas of the world. The removal of large numbers of reef fish has caused the coral reef ecosystems to become unbalanced. As we know, corals are also very popular as decorations. A large amount of the most healthy corals are selected by commercial collectors. They sell the corals to souvenir shops, where a large number of tourists wait to purchase them as decorations or souvenirs. Coral reefs also receive much damage from both commercial and private vessels. The leakage of fuels into the water and the occurrence of spills by large tankers are extremely damaging to local corals. Although much of the coral reef's degradation is directly blamed on human impact, there are several natural disturbances which cause significant damage to coral reefs. The most recognised of these events are hurricanes or typhoons, which bring powerful waves to the tropics. These storm waves cause large corals to break apart and scatter fragments about the reefs. Home to a diverse community of creatures, coral reefs are underwater treasure chests of colour and activity. Predators and prey swim and crawl among the coral in nature's never-ending dance of life and death. This lively, fascinating world beneath the waves is just waiting to be explored. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.